Okay, just checking out this latest correspondence game that I've played. And it's the only one that I've pulled out of uh, playing several um, correspondence games because it highlights the fried liver and the awesomeness of playing the fried liver and playing it well and the potential for the strength using the fried liver. Also, I'm going to look at the negative sides of using the fried liver as well. So we're going to dive in. We're playing as black. So it's a one move a day type of game. So you can make, you've got 24 hours in which to make a move. So we push through the center, just blocking the pawn off like we do. And the knight comes down, so we bring our knight basically, you know, just uh, managing the square, supporting the pawn. My voice is losing itself a little bit. It was worse uh, yesterday and the day before. So we've got the four knights out, so that's all pretty straightforward, nice and steady. They develop the bishop. And for me, um, I've forgotten the practice that I was getting into, which was actually capturing this pawn with the knight. Um, if you've seen pre older videos, I was getting used to doing this type of manoeuvre. But as I've been playing a few blitzy type games and all that sort of stuff, um, it seems to have jumped out of my um, mental Rolodex. And I need to bring it back into play because it, it is a quite a nice position of capturing um, the pawn and then pushing this pawn up here when the knight captures. So it does give me a fairly half decent position. But I'd forgotten to do that on this in this particular game. So I brought the bishop through, looking to go on castle. Nothing wrong with that. And then the, bring the knight down, looking for the fried liver attack. Throughout the majority of the recent games that I've played, when, when players have done this type of maneuver, they've not gone the full way with the fried liver attack. They've decided, mm, maybe not. But this player did. And because I've not played against the fried liver for a long while, I sat, I was like, whoa, what do we do? We weren't panicked because we know that we can gain some positive types of positions against the fried liver. But the awesomeness of the fried liver, if you're not used to it, you can actually lose out. So we captured with the rook and they captured with the knight. So the principle is now they're two pieces down. Let, let's not look at the strength of the pieces. Let's have a look at the, the pieces that they've got. They've now voluntarily given up two pieces for one piece. Logically, that shouldn't work because you've put yourself down a piece. No matter what that type of piece is, you've put yourself down a piece. When you're down a pawn, Sometimes it's hard to gain an advantage because you're down a pawn. So the same thing for the fried liver, in a sense, it's that you're giving up a piece and not necessarily for a better position on the board. It's just material loss. So the castle and we push through the center. We're trying to get some disturbance, obviously wanted to get as many pieces into the game as possible. Bishop, wherever, you know, so at least then we can maybe start focusing towards the king area. Key thing for me is giving my king some company with our pieces. So they push through and now we're looking to grab, maybe try and get the queen off the board if anything, because we have more pieces on the board. Not looking at the strength of those pieces, we have more pieces on the board and we're a bit more developed in terms of pieces that we've got out. They've only got a knight out at the moment. Based on the fact that they've lost about three or four tempi with the knight and the bishop actually going in for the kill. So that's my thought process, that's what I'm thinking. So the bishop comes out, I'm thinking, okay, yeah, you can reduce down. I'm fairly happy with that. We're still going to have one more piece than you. So we capture the pawn, looking to disturb the center a little bit, make some space for our pieces. And they capture. So as we said, we want to give the king some company, but we also have a two-on-one here on the pawn with the queen attacking. 
so we're trying to maintain a good attacking position as well as a defensible position as well around our king they do capture reducing down so i'm feeling fairly happy and comfortable with that still got pieces around our king giving our king company we still have a two on one on this pawn so the queen comes down putting a check on the king so it's a single attack it's not working the team together i'm happy gauge bass happy for us as well which is good but you know i'm not playing for the gauge bar i'm playing for position on the board as best possible so we bring the bishop back now attacking the smaller piece attacking the higher piece can't be wrong so it's going to hopefully lose more tempe swinging the queen around so the queen comes up so now we're looking to exchange off the queen see if we can get the big gun off the board if it doesn't want to hopefully it's going to lose more tempe by basically moving away from any potential exchanges so they come through the center and put a check on our king but we'll move the king out of the way so the queen comes out of the picture it's um again it's just another queen move none of their team are working which is good for us so we can attack the queen again smaller piece attacking a higher piece how many times is this queen getting hit and they're losing tempo in terms of developing their pieces these poor pieces haven't moved apart from this one just for the castling so the two rooks aren't using their power base as yet so the queen moves again it's attacking the pawn here We're hopefully going for a greedy munch so we move the knight up hoping they go down as we've seen in the greedy munch videos it's taking the kick queen away from protection of their king we're looking for a basic iron up of the putting a check on the king here if the knight to knight takes queen takes reducing down and we'll have more pieces around the king area so they don't go for that just yet they go for a check on our king so we can attack the queen again with a lesser piece so again winning more important tempi gauge bar still up up there for us but it's just reduced down a little bit but like i said i'm not playing for the gauge bar i'm playing for the comfortableness of a good position on the board and whilst their queen is losing tempi and it's constantly having to move it's really disturbing the timing and tempo of the rook's powers because they're not owning a file they're not directed down any file so they're losing a lot of momentum so eventually the queen takes the pawn we've gone for the greedy munch so now we go with the knight attacking the king up here it might not be the best move but it's an idea just to get pieces off the board because we have more pieces if we reduce down it's going to be a little harder for the opponent to get his pieces working together so the knight does take the queen takes all simple stuff and then the rook comes across attacking looking to get the pawn here initially i'm thinking i don't really think that's too much of a problem because at the end of the day the queen is not in a favorable position yes it's going to snap up a few pawns but their team is not working together as a team there's going to be a few momentary checks on our king because it's airy which is fine but it's the queen overworking if the queen does come and attack the king we can simply maneuver we can simply block we can do anything we want because the rooks aren't really doing what they're supposed to be doing which is championing open files so they do greedy munch it's a single attack and it's not really got any support with any other pieces i am thinking well okay maybe if they get this then they've got like a three on one once this pawn disappears but our queen is currently protecting this pawn so a smaller piece attacking a higher piece can't be wrong it's got a nice diagonal through to the pawn in front of the king can't be bad if they take then we can take quite easily with the bishop and then we're we're quids in on the position so the queen comes back putting a check on the king as we've mentioned we can move the king to the side and the rook takes and the bishop can take so now a queen with two bishops against a rook and a queen should really be doable we have options 
you know, we have smaller piece attacking the higher piece, maybe bringing it back here, we could take the pawn off the board. The whole idea I'm thinking is if they get their rook here at some point, then maybe they can challenge us. So we've got to be mindful what they can do to us. Queen's always got this manoeuvre here, putting a check on and putting pressure onto the uh, bishop. With the rook then if it faces down then it's going to have a 2 on one on the bishop. Those were the only types of positions that I could envisage them getting any ad key advantage on. So I had to be very mindful of that. So the queen did come down to the bottom but it's also attacking a pawn here. In my head I'm thinking it's kind of greedy munching because Once our queen comes and blocks the potential for this rook coming here, which we just highlighted was their strength area of putting a two on one on the bishop, then there's not much else that they can do. Yes, they can greedy munch the pawn, but it's not improving their position. And the power base for their attack is basically the queen being in this corner. So if we can get our bishop here, preventing that once he's taken, then his queen can no longer come here. Yes, it can come back, come back down. Our king can come back up to safety quite easily. And then there are numerous kind of tricks coming towards the king area. So they do actually capture. So we bring the bishop up like we explained, covering this angle here. I mean, the gauge bar is not singing happily. It's like it's saying, well, you're winning, but it's never here nor there, it's 0.8. So we're not doing anything too major, but for me, I'm feeling fairly comfortable that we've blocked off the potential attacks that the opponent was going to take forward. So the queen does come down and put the check on. Again, it's overworking the queen because it's got nothing else supporting it. The, the rook is not going to be coming and attacking the queen. So it looks like our bishop at some point is potentially going to be putting pressure here key thing is this maneuver so if we get this queen here then we're going to have a checkmate threat and what else can actually prevent that if they push this pawn to defend this bishop can go here with a check on the king so it's going to be a little bit of hurt for the king in terms of development so the longer the bigger picture from doing the fried liver attack it really has improved our position because of the key element that their major piece, the Queen, has been attacked numerous times, making them lose tempo and not really affording a team event. It's been a single event with the Queen being away from their own King, not giving the King any company. The King feels safe, but the Rook is inactive, so it feels kind of useless. So we bring the king up and the king moves. So at this point in time, this is where the danger can come in because now if we come here, there's nothing much else that can be done because they've gone to probably the worst square on the board. If we come here, if they did that, then this bishop with the support from my queen, which would be here, would have a skewer on the queen and the king. So we would win the queen. So that was a simple pattern recognition to, to notice in this game. So we moved the queen and then at that point the opponent resigned. So a very interesting game of dealing with the fried liver. And they manoeuvred as I would kind of expect. Because at the end of the day you're down a piece. So logically you're going to be disadvantaged. Or you're dis disadvantaging yourself, depending on how the opponent plays the game. You may get lucky, it does shock people. You have to find the right positions in order to be able to deal with things like the, the fried liver. Again, it's also about the gambits, you know, dealing with gambits is the same type of thing. People are offering something for free so that you lose tempo by capturing it. You might be okay capturing it once, maybe twice, but after that, you're really losing tempo because you're not developing other pieces. And that's the whole idea behind this game here today. It's about 
the queen was being overworked because the queen had come out so early it was being attacked and it had to move it got attacked it had to move and all the while his other pieces were not getting into the game but even at the end of the game you could still see there was potential for them if we weren't aware of what they were potentially going to do so it's being mindful about the potential of what they can do yes you've got more pieces on the board and we've always said this it doesn't really matter how many pieces you've got on the board if they're not in the right positions then the tantamount to being useless so we had to be mindful of our position especially around this part here where we talked about okay the only thing that we can see them doing is utilizing the power of their pieces the rook can come here put a two on one queen can come here and squish the king so instead of thinking greedily this is why you probably lose against the fried liver and you're thinking you've got more pieces on the board so you go in for the kill and you, you're overextending your pieces and not looking at what the opponent can potentially do to you and that's how the fried liver will win against you